Hi, Brian Kaufman, a retired family physician and CLL patient myself and Chief Medical Officer of the nonprofit CLL Society here at ASH 2019. I'm John Allen. I am an assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell in New York City. Uh, I specialize in CLL and uh, treating patients with lymphoid malignancies and have a, a special research interest in treating patients uh, with CLL who have Richter's transformation. So I think all CLL patients dread Richter's transformation. Can you tell us a little bit about Richter's transformation in your research that kind of looks to like how can we prognosticate what markers can we see about the Richters? Because you've got some original research you're presenting here. Sure. Yeah, so Richter's transformation is a, is a term that when patients with CLL look up their disease, they will read about it and want more information because it can be a very aggressive form of the disease CLL. It's, and essentially what it is is when the disease, the, the uh, less aggressive CLL, can transform into an aggressive uh, lymphoma, most commonly diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Now, uh, many patients uh, get very uh, concerned about this when they are initially diagnosed, but what I always tell my patients and what I reassure them about is that while this can be a, um, uh, a thing that we don't want to have to deal with, fortunately uh, only about 10% of CLL patients overall actually transform in their, in, their, in their lifetime. And so it is relatively restricted to a minor group of patients. With that said, this 10% of patients are enriched for very high risk genomic abnormalities and features and mutations specifically. And it's these patients that we try to look for and identify at diagnosis and, and uh, um, keep a close eye on as they are going through maybe a watch and wait period uh, to where we initiate treatment if we see signs of disease progression. And, and the hopes with these new drugs that we have, uh, BTK inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors, and earlier use of those drugs uh, as first lines of therapy that we might be able to potentially impact the actual incidence of developing Richter's over time. And so these things are being tested and, and ultimately um, with the use of these new drugs hopefully we see less of the disease. So this is a real paradigm shift because when we had more toxic and less effective treatments the point was to push the treatment off as far as you could because mm -hmm. once you started treatment the clock started ticking in terms of how long you were going to live to be mm -hmm. honest because there was very few treatment options right. but now when we have these great treatments and new ones coming down the pipe it seems like there's this shift towards instead of letting the CLL progress and especially maybe mutate mm -hmm. and turn bad maybe kick it while it's down you don't want to start too soon, but you want to sort of that Goldilocks like effect, you know, get it before it becomes aggressive. Is this, yeah. this is kind of a different philosophy on how to treat it. Yeah, so the standard of care is still to watch and wait. There is still mm. a period of watch and wait. So if we do identify high risk features, uh, we, you know, the standard approach is still to observe for a period of time and we wait for, sim uh, for patients to develop mm. symptoms or develop cytopenias. Uh, before cytopenias, can you tell us what those So are? low blood counts okay. essentially that yeah. might cause them fatigue or bruising and things like that. Um, uh, or infections. And so we wait to see these start to change and, and meet certain thresholds. With that said though, because we have these new drugs, because they are well tolerated, if we do, and, and the fact that current uh, recommendations are to test for these high-risk genomic abnormalities and identify these patients early, um, there is a, a push towards uh, um, maybe possibly in the future managing these high-risk patients differently and, and not necessarily waiting so long until they are uh, uh, very symptomatic and or sick or the disease has progressed and taken on maybe a second or a third or even a fourth mutation that might put them at risk for transformation. And so, um, you know, outside of a clinical trial, these are things you can discuss with your doctor and typically we'll still wait till we see true disease activity. Um, uh, but because of these new drugs, uh, sometimes in my practice, if I identify a high-risk patient, I may and, and likely are to intervene slightly earlier than I might let a patient meet all of the thresholds and all of the criteria and all these numbers uh, before they drop, before I uh, in, you know, b initiate treatment. 
Yeah, so this is really changing, and where it is is going to vary from doctor to doctor and center to center about right. when you jump in, but it is changing, yeah. It's a t tell me a little bit about, there's a marker CD79, mm -hmm. am I, uh, do I have that right, yep. that you looked at specifically on Richter's, and how, what should a patient know about that? Yeah, so CD79B is a, is a uh, marker that's on the surface of the cell. And uh, it essentially, it's part of the B cell receptor complex. The okay. B cell receptor complex is a big word and big concept to think about, but ultimately uh, it is a major signaling protein uh, for CLL cells and for Richter cells and for lymphoma cells in general. And, and CD79B is one protein of this complex. And so uh, uh, this protein is expressed on the surface of the cell and so it's outside side of the cell essentially and recently there have been developments of a drug uh, called polituzumab that actually can target CD79B um, and, and is currently FDA approved to target CD79B in combination with bendamustine and rituximab in patients with relapse refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. What's interesting about this protein specifically is that um, during the development of polituzumab, patients with Richter's transformation are generally, were, were excluded from most of those clinical trials. And so we don't know the activity of that drug in that very specific patient population because they also develop a, uh, a unique form of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Additionally, uh, CLL is known to historically have low expression of this protein on its cellular surface. And uh, that's due to a few, gen what is believed to be a few genomic uh, changes that occur and, and different uh, splicing of the, uh, of the messenger RNA that uh, decreases the cellular, uh, extracellular expression. And so um, what the research that I've done and I'll be presenting here is that what we wanted to explore is and, and observe is uh, Richter's transformation, diffuse large B cell lymphoma arising from CLL. Uh, does it have, does it change its expression of CD79B? Does it have low expression of CD79B or because of this transformation and this, this turning into a new disease, can it maybe start to even overexpress that protein, whereas previously the CLL cell was not? And so what we sought to do is, is to uh, take samples, patient samples that had Richter's transformation, and stain them with an antibody uh, against CD79B and characterize that expression, characterize how bright the expression was, characterize how many cells were in fact positive uh, uh, for that protein, and uh, essentially um, um, you know, establish whether or not this protein was on or off. Because if it was on, it can lead to a potential new target for patients with Richter's transformation, specifically using this drug such as polituzumab uh, that targets CD79B specifically. And did you find so, a lot of it uh, on, because it's not there in CLL or very low expression levels, what, what happens when it becomes Richter's? Yeah, so we looked at about 19 patients with Richter's transformation, and, and these are rare patients, mm -hmm. so you don't, you can't, and this was all from a single center, so uh, you don't have tons of patients always to necessarily look at, but we identified 19 patients, and what we found is that 84% of patients with Richter's transformation, uh, their sample actually did express CD79B. Interestingly, um, uh, the vast majority of those subjects uh, had relatively strong uh, expression of the protein, much more so than uh, CLL that had not transformed. And so there is something that is changing uh, seemingly in these, in these transformed samples. Uh, what's unique and kind of something that we observed is that not every single cell in the, in the transformation uh, lymphoma was expressing the protein. And in fact, there appears to be several populations within this mixture of cells um, that, that might be positive. And so it's not completely uniform, but some cases were completely uniform and very bright. Some cases were very bright, but less uniform and, and, and spotty. Other cases were more 
uh, uniform but less bright. And, and, um, and so there it's a heterogeneous mixture of patients. What's important though is what we did find that there was some extracellular expression in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in these Richter's samples. And um, uh, what's also important is that the drug polituzumab is something uh, of a class of drugs called antibody d um, drug conjugates or ADCs. Right, right. And so very hot topic. So it's a hot topic and, and um, uh, these drugs are like brintuximab, vidotin. Uh, there are a few other ADCs that are currently FDA approved. Essentially they're an antibody that has a payload that brings the anti-cancer drug directly to its target so there's not as much systemic toxicity, it's just going to whatever the cancer it's trying to attack is. Exactly, yeah. and what's unique about ADCs is that um, you don't necessarily have to bind every single cell, and every single cell does not in fact have to have high expression of the protein. What we found is that when the drug gets brought into, let's say, this heterogeneous population that is intermixed with all of these cells, um, it goes in, it kills that cell, but that toxin is still hanging around. And then that can spill out uh, into the microenvironment and potentially be taken up uh, uh, by cells that have lower expression because the toxin is still getting into them and it was still getting localized in the tissue that is problematic and cancerous. And so we've seen this in many studies that use ADCs is that you don't necessarily, responses don't necessarily correlate with high expression of the protein that the antibody targets. And in fact, if you have some expression, many times the responses were just just as good as someone with the highest expression and it's felt to be uh, believed by this phenomenon that I'm talking about to where the cells that do take up the, the toxin die off and then kind of release it into the microenvironment where the, the toxin can continue to kill the cells that are around it that may not have that high expression. Yeah, Fascinating. Any final thoughts for a patient in terms of this research in Richter's? So this has led to, uh, um, you know, this this is data that could lead to uh, potential Richter-specific clinical trials using this drug in combination with chemotherapy, and uh, um, is uh, is potent is identifying a new target that we might be able to want to to target, and and you know, we're in the works of trying to make that a reality. Very exciting because Richter's is uh, for me one of the screaming unmet needs in CLL. Absolutely, it is. Thanks so much for the research you're Thank doing. You Thank so you. Much. Absolutely.